uh, talk about uh, the Internet of Things. And uh, please welcome Mr. Martin Spindler from Berlin uh, Strategy Consultants. Hello. It works. Great. Cool to see you all here. Um, I'll try my best to drown out all the other noise. Um, if I'm too little to understand, please give me a sign, okay? I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things and especially how principles of the Internet play out in the real world. Um, although I'm going to start with a little information about myself. Um, my name is Martin Spindler. I'm a strategy consultant for the Internet of Things and Smart Energy here in Berlin. Um, I've started my career in the in Internet of Things essentially with a conference and bar camp in Berlin 2009, which was called Atoms and Bits, which basically laid the foundation of what are we going to talk about here. I'm the co-founder of the Cognitive Cities Conference, um, a, uh, as the title implies, a conference about what sensors and increased smartness will do to a city. And I'm a member of Council, which is a uh, global Internet of Things think, ta think tank. Also, I'm the founding member of, and this is very interesting, um, Internet of People uh, Strategy Consultancy Network. Um, we are working with large commercial clients and we're working on policy setting for Internet of Things uh, in the European Union. About eight years ago, I started studying, and as a lot of students do, I needed to find a way to finance my studies. So what I did was I took one of the first offers, one of the best offers I could get, um, which was a job as a customer service representative for an energy company in Germany. I spent a lot of time talking on phones about energy lines, energy production, energy transmission, and energy consumption. Now here's a question, who of you actually knows how much electricity they consume annually? Thought so. That's three shows of hands. Now I started working in the energy sector when you'd regularly see uh, magazine covers like that. That of course is Kevin Rose, the founder of Dick, and where all of you have been time person of the year. I've started working in the energy sector when the word prosumer was big in the vocabulary of the Web 2.0 consultants and when user-generated content was bound to upend traditional newspaper industries. And of course I was thinking, hold on a second, prosumer, producer and consumer in parallel? That's pretty much what we are talking about, isn't it? Um, and so, so it piqued my interest in looking how all those hot new mechanisms of the internet um, pretty much have equivalent systems in the real world. So I started working on smart energy systems, um, on electricity meters that are more intelligent and hopefully will lead to more than three people in this audience finally knowing their annual electricity consumption. And we of course realized that all that information becomes disintermediated because one of the main reasons why nobody here knows their electricity consumption is because it's, the meter is mostly in the cellar and nobody bothers going there. But while looking at these developments, something struck me. If you look at the evolution of the phone, that's quite obvious. So this is a 1950s phone beautifully restored. You can buy that on Etsy if you want to. Um, this is what phones used to be. And that's only 60 years ago. And this is about 40 years ago. We moved into handheld 
headphones. Um, this is funny scene in Wall Street 2, I don't know if you've seen the movie, uh, where the character gets released and gets back his top of the line phone, which was very similar to that one. Um, that's how far technology, how fast technology is moving. If you scale back just 10 years, this was a top of the line phone. And probably not even 10 years, it must be about seven to eight years. And then of course we have this. Um, we're gonna see that picture quite often in this talk. And then we're talking about the energy sector again, where this is the same contraption, same appliance that has been around for about a hundred years. That made me wonder. Technology is moving hella fast. Um, this really becomes obvious if you look at this spec. A lot changes in just a decade. You have 2000, a top of the line iMac and 2010, the base model iPhone 4. The iPhone 4 outperforms the top of the line iMac in almost, in almost every category. And it's under this assumption that technology moves extremely fast that we have to look at the Internet of Things. Now the Internet of Things is notoriously hard to describe. This is out of Time magazine, Inventions of the Year 2008. I love the illustration of the Internet of Things because no matter how you look at it, it makes no sense. All we know is the Internet of Things is going to be big. It's going to be real big. Um, here's a couple of projection stats uh, from several research groups and companies. I really like IBM with one trillion connected devices by 2015. This translates to about 130 connected devices per person globally which is really interesting. Um, those numbers are quite impressive and they have some credence to it. However, if you look at where we are today already, so this is just my household. Um, I live with my partner. Um, I just did a count on how many IP, connect IP addresses um, are used in our household and we have 15 devices just between the two of us. I'd wager a lot of participants of Campus Party have even more devices. Interestingly, we humans on the internet are already the minority. There's 2.3 billion people online, we already have 5 billion internet connected devices. Uh, what do those devices look like? What do they do? Um, there's a lot of very nice design about that. And there is one device which I always like to show in my talks about the Internet of Things um, because it's immediately obvious what it does. Uh, this, of course, is um, a thermostat. It does exactly what a thermostat does. It regulates the heating and cooling. I guess we could use some heating here today. Um, but it's smart, it's internet connected, it's incredibly well designed. And to be honest, you don't actually have to use the thermostat so often because once you set it up, you can use that via your phone. Or we uh, can talk about smart and internet connected body scales, which are quite interesting. Um, which lead to social pressure effects, sorry Dennis, um, of your body scale automatically tweeting out your weight. But it actually quite easily helps you to do the job you're doing when you step on the body scale far easier. Because when you step on the scale, most of the time you're not really interested in your weight at that point in time. But what you really want to know is a vector. Is, is the mapping of your weight over time. So these are quite nice appliances. These are good examples. Um, 
of your household items being connected to the internet. Of course, there's plenty more examples. Um, what I always quite like um, when we're talking about internet examples um, and the mechanisms of the internet translated in the real world is something called resource sharing. Now, of course, resource sharing really only makes sense where you have high capital intense appliances, which you don't actually need that often. And judging by the age bracket, which must be mostly present here, one good example of that is, of course, cars. Now, this is a quite nice app. This is a Berlin-based car sharing provider. Uh, it has a live app. You are here. Um, these are the car cars. There's a screenshot I made about an hour ago. So these cars were here. And if you see, you can easily book a car. The nice thing about that is that it doesn't have a station model. So these cars are just on the street. You get your app out. I could do that right now if I wanted to. You choose a car and you book it. And it's something like that. Then you have an RFID chip with which you authenticate. And inside there's basically an Android phone which, with which you authenticate as well. So you have a chip and a pin. And off you go. You can ride. Once you're done, you lock out. And the car appears on a map again. Um, this only works because cars are on the internet nowadays. So, what we traditionally have been doing about resource sharing, especially car sharing, is you have uh, station models we have to go up to. We have to check whether a car is available. We probably have to talk to a service person renting out that car. This way, it makes it much easier, much more frictionless, and much more on the go. Cars are in the, on the internet. I quite like that. Um, and if you want to know how much cars are in the internet, here's what all owners of the latest Ford cars got within that year, within the last half year. This is the software update to the car Ford Sync platform. Now, if you want to ride your Ford car, you now have to regularly plug in software updates into your car. Your car right now is a driving computer. This would have been unimaginable just 10 years ago. So why does all that happen? I take it it's safe to assume that everybody here is familiar with Moore's Law? Yes? Good. Then everybody, does anybody know the Cray 2? That's the NASA style supercomputer. It did 1.5 gigaflops in 84. It actually ranked in the top 10 of the world's supercomputers until 1994. It was a beast of a machine. As you can see, it needed a full room just to be operated. It did about 1.5 gigaflops, which is 1.5 million floating point operations per second. That's 20 years ago, right? Now the iPad is doing that. Um, I find that comparison staggering. Um, that really shows how far we've come in, in a mere 20, 25 years. So, computation is getting cheaper, it's getting more space efficient, and, and that's interesting, it's getting more energy efficient. So, th has anybody here before heard of Kumi's Law? Show of hands? Nobody. That's expected, kind of. Kumi's Law is a very interesting corollary to uh, Moore's Law. Kumi's Law essentially states that the energy efficiency of a chip doubles every one and a half years. Which gives us about eight orders of magnitude per decade. So the same amount of computation, the same 1.5 gigaflops, 
take a fraction of the power just a couple of decades later to drive that point home is a current top the line notebook it has a spec out battery runtime of about six hours Use a top of the line Mac uh, uh, notebook from 1992. That's two sec two decades old. Um, it has a spec out energy, uh, a spec out battery runtime of 1.5 hours. The interesting thing is, if you applied 1992 energy efficiency standards, the energy efficiency standards of that computer to that computer its battery would be dry, completely empty, in a matter of 1.5 seconds. Kumi's law, it says computation and gets much, much more power efficient. You can now run sensor nodes with 2.2 by 2 millimeter solar panels and completely power those chips. And we have a third law, and I guess everybody should be familiar with that. It's called Metcalfe's law. It basically says that the total value of a network grows exponentially to the number of the nodes in the network. More, more plain term, it's called network effects. This is a network chart of the internet, and of course this is the network chart of the biggest network of people. Mackel's law proved really important in implementing telephone systems because one telephone couldn't just call one more telephone it could call every other telephone so the network the value of the network massively increased and that's why it's really hard to leave Facebook nowadays because all your friends are there what do all those three laws say we have Moore's law making computation ever more cheap. We have Kumi's law, which drives down the uh, power requirements we, ha we have to embed for computation. And we have Mackel's law, which basically gives us a strong economic incentive to put out more computing devices. So we have all that. Now we have to think about how do we use those capabilities. Now there's plenty of examples of poorly thought out implementation of computation. This is um, the infamous internet connected fridge. You'd think that idea would have burst with the 1999 bubble as arguably in 1999 uh, the first smart fridge was introduced um, but this is a Samsung smart fridge which debuted just this year at the CES where incidentally this picture as well has been made we're talking about lighting this is a light bulb by, by um, lightning science the company is called I think and it features an IPv6 addressable stack. So you can talk to that light bulb with your phone, which of course makes some engineers go a bit overboard in their predictions about what you want to do in your home. Um, would like to think of your entire home as an accessory, or better yet, as a network of accessories and think of Android as the operating system for your home. That, of course, is not how most people think about their homes. Uh, your phone is an accessory to your home, not your home to your phone, as well as your, as your fridge probably does not need Twitter. What always rubs me about those ideas about the implementation of the Internet of Things is that it's basically very old ideas. This is the X10 powerhouse for C64. Um, that was commercially available in 1986. It's 25 years ago. That's the time of the Cray 2, which I've just shown you. 
and we're still talking about the same metaphors in most of the discourse about connecting devices to the internet. Now I've shown plenty of bad examples on how to use connectivity in your devices. I want to talk about the really, truly staggering, the really life-saving. There's health, for instance. So uh, I grew up in Germany. Uh, in Germany, uh, it used to be uh, mandatory to uh, either serve in the military or do something called civil service, which mostly takes place in hospitals. Now, I served in, in a hospital in a close psychiatric ward, and we had one huge issue, which is patient compliance. Patients, once they were on the way of getting better, would unilaterally cut off their medication. And there's no way, it's very bad for them because they relapse in their, in their uh, sickness. Um, but it's understandable because medication has side effects. Or you can think about the elderly who often for, just forget about their medication. Now here you have a GSM embedded pill bottle which will not only notify you by means of its base station to take your pills but will register if you have done so. Um, it's used with a very interesting social connection system because if you, if you haven't taken your pills two hours after you were scheduled to do that you will get called by, uh, by service representatives of that company reminding you to take your pills. Um, data is gathered about your compliance, helping doctors to better diagnose you. Because one of the huge issues doctors have is they have no idea what, the parents, what their patients do at home. They have no idea whether they're actually taking the medication, whether they should up the medication or whether they should take the medication down. So that is a very, very um, cost-saving, life-saving and confidence-freezing solution, which just works by basically a motion sensor and a GSM con. Now I've talked about cars that now work in a, in a stationless model. In most cities, you still have stations, though. And I don't know who from here is from London. London has a very interesting bike sharing system. It's called Barclays Bikes. It's very cheap and it's almost all over the city. The very interesting thing about Barclays Bike though is first it's station bound. So this happens very often. But the data is available on the internet. So you could potentially just scrape the data or look at the website whenever you go somewhere where is the closest station. You could, however, just hack a solution together, which a friend of mine did, displaying where stuff is available, where bikes are available. And this is basically a message I want to give you with. This, the real world is hackable once we implement this and there's no reason why you should encounter this on a regular basis. Now, I've talked about how important health is and uh, how an easy solution like that can certainly improve a lot of people's lives. Now, I want to talk about catastrophe. This is a map of Japan about two months after the Fukushima disaster. This is citizen assembled Geiger counter readings. They're assembled with contraptions like these. This is a old school Geiger counter. That Geiger counter is about 20, 30 years old. Uh, it used the audio output, fed that into an Arduino board, um, which basically just measured the rate with which the audio pulses came in, translated that into digital, um, fed that into a wireless shield, which fed that directly into the internet. 
Um, this was the first rough draft, and to uh, showcase that, you all have sensor platforms with you right now. This is what a friend of mine called a city sampler. Modern iPhone has about 13 sensors. Now the interesting thing is that's easily extendable. If you look at this, this is really cumbersome to, to take around to make measurements. Um, this works to have a stationary signal, like how high is radiation outside my house. If you, however, want to map the radiation of a country after a disaster, why not leverage the device you already have and extend it by adding a Geiger tube? Doing in miniature what you've done with the big tube. This is um, the iGeigi, beautiful name. Um, and that was produced by a group called SafeCast, uh, which formed right after the Fukushima disaster, which hugely helped in creating this map and now works to uh, provide a database of the worldwide baseline radiation. This is a hackers, and hackers initiative. This is people being fed up with misinformation by governments and corporate um, and just doing something about it. And Geiger tubes aren't cheap, but they're not that expensive. You all got your phones and the uh, soldering platforms of PCBs are very cheap. Now what came out of this, first off, is that for the first time the Japanese government was actually held accountable after the Fukushima disaster, but a lot of people realized the value that this distributed data gathering in the real world has. Much like in the early days of the internet, distributed information sharing was what really took it off. This is what, what gets the attention, uh, which has sparked initiatives like this. Um, the Air Quality Act, which is an open source sensor platform uh, meant to be assembled by participants in the program um, and basically meant to constantly monitor the air quality in your area. So you can put that on your roof, have a constant feed of what the data, what the air is like in your area. Because, let's face it, you have no, no way of telling how good your air is and you have no accountability whatsoever. So this platform comes standard with CO2 measurements, with um, carbon monoxide measurements, with, with uh, sulfur measurements and um, fine dust measurements and optical sensor. And you can equip that with a Geiger tube as well. So. Um, you got even more data from maps like that. Science has discovered that. This is a humidity and carbon emission sensor, uh, which was used to, uh, for the first time, try to measure how soil actually works, how the earth and feels like outside the air actually ingests and digests carbon dioxide. All that is a very, very complicated way of saying that we have plenty of data out there. There's plenty of data already being generated. Um, this is an excerpt of a very interesting blog post called The Street as a Platform. The Street is immersed in twitching poles and cloud of data. Everything is emitting data. And with the three laws we described earlier, it's getting damn easy to capture all that data and to use that. This is what is interesting about that. This is a platform which makes it easy even for the novice to hack together things like the iGeigy. This uh, is the Raspberry Pi. That's a full-featured Linux computer for $35. So, the Internet of Things is happening. And this might very much be preaching to the choir. But 
that are good hacking. Thanks. Questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Martin. Anyone has questions? Has a question? No questions at all? If, um, if a person's got quite limited experience with sort of hardware hacking, are there guides out there, are there ways to get into it? I mean, what, what would you suggest as a path to starting? To starting, um, I definitely check out the the Arduino forums and the guides there because they have very extensive documentation for getting started. Um, I definitely uh, regularly check out this website called Hackaday, uh, which not only features very interesting proje projects which basically try to do hardware hacking, but often links to very interesting guides on how to do stuff. Any more questions? No? Nope. Then I would say... Well, then I'm off the hook early. Okay. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Martin Spindler. <laughs> so, we're going to have a break. Um, we start again at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, the next big thing is on the main stage. Nelly okay. Kurs is talking about her vision.